Center, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Wilson Center for Scholars to the fifth lecture in the series, The Past, Present, and Future of Women's History. This is a joint project of the Wilson Center and the National Museum of Women's History, and in a moment I'm going to introduce you to Joan Wages, who's president of the museum, who's, who will tell you more about it. Did she just disappear? Okay, okay. Anyway, um, she'll tell you about uh, the museum and its connection to the Wilson Center. Um, the center, as many of you know, is a living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. It's a bu building that talks back, unlike the marble statues out on the wall. And in recognition of, of Wilson's career as both a scholar and a public servant, the mission of the center is to bring together scholars and policymakers to address a wide range of public issues. Women's issues have, of course, long been on the public agenda, so this series falls squarely within the mandate of the center. President Wilson was known for many things, but perhaps most important in this context is, was his role in, the help, in helping to pass the 19th Amendment. Although he was not an enthusiastic supporter of women's suffrage at the beginning, <laughs> he did get on board eventually, and in 1918 and 1919, he took several crucial steps that succeeded in pushing the amendment through Congress. Winning the vote was, of course, a landmark event in American women's history, and I know it will feature prominently among the exhibits at the National Museum, Women's History Museum, so perhaps President Wilson will make an appearance there as well. Let me now turn the podium over to Joan Wages, who will tell you more about the museum and its present status. Thank you to everyone for coming this afternoon. This is um, another one in our lecture series uh, talking about women's history. As so many of you know, women's history is missing from uh, textbooks. Only one in 10 figures in today's history textbooks is about a woman from history. Less than 8% of the statues in our national parks are of a woman leader. And if you go to our nation's capital, which should be representing all of us and um, in, the, in the percentages that we uh, um, uh, represent in a, this country, only 14 out of the 219 statues are of women. So we still have a ways to go. Uh, our story is that women have been left out of our national story, and women's history is America's history. Uh, we are just delighted to have Dr. Hayden with us today. Uh, last night, I had the great pleasure of having dinner with Dr. Hayden and Dr. Michelle. And, um, it, you know, I just continue to realize how little I know about women's history, how much there is to learn. Uh, I think today will be a fascinating lecture and will give us great insight into what we need to think about when we are creating this museum to represent our nation's women. So thank you, Dr. Hayden, for coming today, and uh, thank you for coming. Thanks, Joan. What uh, Joan didn't mention is that if you, the museum now currently exists in a virtual form. So if you want to find out, if you want to visit the museum, go to www.nwhm, right? Dot org. No, M N W H M dot org. <laughs> and there's, there's a, it's a fantastic website. There's already, there are already many exhibits on it, and you will find there see much to, much to see and much to learn. In designing a museum of history, any history, women's history or anything else. Planners must think of ways to bring the past to life, not through words on the page, as historians do when they're writing books, but through visual materials and sometimes oral one, ones as well. Artifacts and images moving as well as still. Images, artifacts, images that tell a story. The designers of the National Women's History Museum are perhaps more fortunate than most because women live their lives so much in and through visual materials. We are admittedly material girls, for better or for worse. And over the course of our lives, we collect, we produce, we work in and with, we rearrange mountains and mountains of stuff, stuff that will ultimately make up the exhibits at the museum. Women, of course, are not only concerned with objects, but also with our immediate environments, our homes, our gardens, our neighborhoods and communities. And it's for this reason that I'm so excited about hearing from our guest today, Dolores Hayden. Professor Hayden is one of America's, America's preeminent historians and analysts 
of the built environment, particularly of domestic architecture and neighborhoods, the places where people, and especially women and families, live and work. A trained historian and architect, she has, as you'll soon hear, an intuitive feel, not just for buildings, but for how people inhabit them and how they structure daily lives, how they affect work, pleasure, relationships with one another. Professor Hayden does not use buildings in their images simply to illustrate history, but to tell that history. In her hands, buildings and neighborhoods become living environments as important as any historical actor in shaping human experience. Dolores Hayden's first book, Seven American Utopias, The Architecture of Communitarian, Communitarian Socialism, 1790 to 1975, was published in 1976. It examined how the buildings that utopians designed expressed and enacted the ideals they believed would allow them to perfect their, themselves and their societies. These spaces were not simply imagined, but very much physical realities for these visionary Americans. Hayden's next two books, The Grand Domest Domestic Revolution, A History of Feminist Designs for American Homes, Neighborhoods, and Cities, published in 1981, and then Redesigning the American Dream, Gender, Housing, and Family Life, published in 1984 and then revised into 2002, look specifically at the relationship between women and, the built in, and built environments. Given the fact that women do live so much of their lives in and through their homes and neighborhoods, Hayden shows how central the, the design of these homes and neighborhoods was to the goal of achieving gender equality. Feminist designers came up with some very radical ideas. I won't give them away here, but I'm sure that Dolores has plenty in store for you. Ideas about how to shape the built environment to change the, way, the ways, the division of labor between women and men, the ways that work was done and so forth. But let me give you one hint. This has always been my favorite um, example from the Grand Domestic Revolution. Keep an eye out for kitchenless houses. Kitchenless houses were very important <laughs> in the 19th century. Very radical idea. If there are no kitchens, you don't have to cook. <laughs> in the 1980s, Professor Hayden taught at UCLA, and while she was there, she became involved in an innovative project that looked at urban landscapes as public history. As founder and president of the Power of Place, a nonprofit arts and humanities group based in LA, she laid out a downtown itinerary that celebrated the city's ethnic diversity with projects illuminating the history of African Americans, Latinas, and Japanese Americans. The project was documented in yet another book, The Power of Place, Urban Landscapes as Public History. And I should mention that both this book, The Power of Place, and The Grand Domestic Revolution are available outside. So during the reception, please take a look at them, and Professor Hayden would be glad to sign them. In recent years, Professor Hayden has turned her attention to the built environment on a somewhat broader scale, publishing books entitled Building Suburbia, Green Fields and Urban Growth, in 1820 to 2000, published in 2003, and A Field Guide to Sprawl, published in 2004. I've been following and learning from Dolores Hayden's work on gender, history, and space for many years, but it was only recently that I discovered that she's also an award-winning poet. Her poems have appeared in many magazines and in two collections, the latest entitled Nymph, Dunn, and Spinner. The, the title is just so wonderful and it's really evocative of the, the kinds of poems that I think you'll, you'll find in it. She frequently brings together her interests in language and landscape, not only in her writings, but also in her teaching. In 2010, she created a new class at Yale called Poets Landscapes. Multiply talented, Professor Hayden has been recognized with numerous awards and fellowships. It's truly an honor to welcome her to the Wilson Center. Her talk today is entitled Grand Domestic Revolution, Recovering the Forgotten History of Feminism and Housing Design. Dolores Hayden. Thank you, Sonia, for that wonderful introduction. I'm delighted to be here today. Last year, the Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians invited me to review a museum exhibit entitled Counterspace, Design and the Modern Kitchen, which was organized by Juliet Kinchin at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Perhaps some of you saw that show. Cooking demonstrations, recipe contests, and celebrity appearances attracted large crowds to the show, and this is the catalog, the show highlighted a 1926-27 Frankfurt kitchen, which was designed by the first woman certified as an architect in Austria, Greta Schutt-Lehotsky, 
who worked for public housing architects in Frankfurt, Germany. Now, 10,000 kitchens were built in Frankfurt public housing projects, and they included such 1920s innovations as aluminum containers for food storage, a dish drying rack, a double sink, an ironing board attached to the wall, and an adjustable stool so that a woman could sit while working. Her boss promoted this kitchen as designed by a woman for women. And in this photograph uh, on the left, I think you can see it is a very narrow little kitchen. In fact, it was too narrow for more than one person working in the kitchen. Uh, but the way they displayed it in the museum and photographed it with a, a wide angle lens seemed to make it seem a little brighter and a little, a little more attractive. Uh, in the exhibit, they surrounded the kitchen with the Museum of Modern Art's industrial design collection artifacts, hundreds of small appliances and kitchen gadgets. And the catalog, which had on the cover a woman from 1946 uh, looking at a kitchen as if it were a dollhouse, had end papers with um, a grid of more of these little gadgets, mixing spoons and peelers and uh, egg beaters and so forth. Um, commercial films were part of this exhibit, and they emphasized technology and consumption. General Electric's silent film, for example, The Home Electrical of 1915, featured two men, Mr. Wise and Mr. Newhouse. And Mr. Wise drives Mr. Newhouse to see what he calls my electrical home. They view General Electric's vacuum cleaner, sewing machine, iron, space heater, chafing dish, toaster, stovetop, oven, clothes washer, and ringer, all operated by Mrs. Wise and a servant. <laughs> <laughs> Museum officials boasted that they were making women's history visible. Glenn Lowry, director of MoMA, claimed that the newly acquired Frankfurt Kitchen was, quote, the earliest work by a female architect in MoMA's collection. I was astonished by this because they missed half a century of work by American women architects. Louise Bethune, the first female member of the AIA, opened her office in 1881, and MIT started awarding architecture degrees to women beginning in the 1890s. So there were quite a few things missing in the collection. But let's get back to the kitchen. Although they had acquired the kitchen, and they were obviously quite proud of it, the curators completely missed the controversy. They claimed, quote, to explore the kitchen as a barometer of changing technologies, aesthetics, and ideologies. But the exhibit offered very little analysis of gender, labor, and the domestic workplace. As part of debates about how private and public life would be defined in urban industrial societies at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, kitchen design was the subject of intense controversy. The exhibit at MoMA recapitulated dominant ideas about a woman's proper place at home in an efficient private kitchen without the context of any feminist critiques, or any collective alternatives, whether they came from communist, socialist, or capitalist societies. I'm going to show you some of those alternatives today. But first, let me just say that although the architect, Schut Lahotsky, was a Communist Party member and later worked in the Soviet Union, she was not receptive to any of the ideas of Lenin and Alexander Kollontai, who called for a house of the new way of life with childcare centers and dining halls, and was the subject of quite a few experiments in multifamily housing construction with these facilities in the USSR in the 1920s. Instead, this architect preferred Christine Frederick, who was an American efficiency expert. Frederick was the author of The New Housekeeping, Efficiency Studies in Home Management in 1912. She wanted to subject housework to the same time and motion studies that Frederick Taylor had used to rationalize assembly line work. Christine Frederick wanted to make the housewife both boss and worker in a kitchen resembling an assembly line, 
which she said would be, quote, rationally planned and industrially produced for proper, for popular consumption. And Frederick, later on in 1929, published uh, an even more significant book called Selling Mrs. Consumer, which I will tell you about shortly. Anyway, the curators of Counterspace acquired the Frankfurt Kitchen and they sidelined debates that had taken place from the 1860s to the 1930s. They made their exhibit appear really quite un uncontroversial. It was a history of consumption that moved from the 1920s to our own era. And I should say that I just received an email yesterday from a woman who writes the history of women in Barcelona, and she said she considered this exhibit deceitful. Ooh. So how about the broader history of kitchens? As part of feminist approaches to housing and neighborhood design that include critiques of the homeless workplace and critiques of the woman's role as an unpaid worker within it. I devoted maybe eight years of my life to this particular subject, and I'm really, really pleased uh, that Sonia and Joan invited me to revisit some of this work uh, with you and to think about it again. I'm an urban historian, and I was also trained and licensed as an architect. I wrote The Grand Domestic Revolution in 1981 to document the early experiments which were part of the first wave of the feminist movement here in the United States. And then I went on to write Redesigning the American Dream to treat the years between 1940 and 2000 and to put the American experience in an international perspective. Overall, uh, as Sonia said, I treat built space uh, as a social and economic product and I work on the building process I think about how people shape space at the scale of rooms, buildings, neighborhoods, and cities. And I study how physical structures support or constrain activities. Architecture does not make social change, but it can support it or impede it, especially support or impede the ways that people negotiate and define patterns of private and public life. And housing is a very important subject within a national economy in terms of both the paid labor that's involved in the production of housing and the unpaid labor in social production that housing will frame. Now, back in the mid-1970s, when I started to look at housing patterns and neighborhood design as part of women's history, I decided that I wanted to study resistance to the idea of woman's sphere. I was inspired by two important books that were histories of prescriptive domesticity. Nancy Cott's book on domestic life, The Bonds of Womanhood, Woman's Sphere in New England, 1780 to 1935, and Kitty Sklar's biography of Catherine Beecher. I'm sure many of you know these books, and Catherine Beecher was an author and amateur architect. Uh, she's been called a domestic feminist. She wanted women to take charge of the household in exchange for controlling it and remaining away from public life. She was against suffrage, and she didn't really remain away from public life herself. She told other women to do this, and then she had a career as a, as a lecturer, <laughs> um, prominent advocate of her own ideas and her books. Uh, she sold a lot of books. Uh, the American Woman's Home, uh, was co-authored with her sister, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Anyway, she was a pretty good amateur architect, too. She designed a single sur surface workspace for the kitchen, um, which was in the 1869 book, but she'd been working on it since the 1840s. I was sorry to see that MoMA exhibit attribute her innovations to Frank Lloyd Wright. Oh, no. uh, that was another thing they got wrong. Anyway, Beecher is not, however, one of the people that I want to talk to you about today. Um, the people I want to talk to you about are the group I called material feminists. And I coined that term to describe activist women who worked at the scale of home and neighborhood and wished to transform women's sphere altogether as part of the material conditions of women's lives. 
They were in contact and in some cases close to figures in the suffrage movement, figures in the temperance movement, uh, but they were often in dialogue with them and I want to say more about uh, that dialogue. The material feminists had three things they wanted to do. First of all, challenge the traditional male-headed family. Um, a grand domestic revolution was a phrase from an article on childcare in Woodhull and Claflin's Weekly in 1871. Secondly, they wanted to establish women's economic independence. They did not see all women as becoming wage workers eventually, as some socialists did. They wanted women to take control of their own labor in social reproduction, whether they were housewives, servants, single women, or perhaps a new class of professional workers such as childcare experts, home economists, or housing reformers. And third, they wanted to reshape the built environment to support a transformation of the family and social reproduction. Now, the historical context is one in which pre-industrial homemaking, uh, which is described, I think, quite well in this frontispiece to a housekeeper's uh, annual of 1844, showing the woman um, ironing, uh, baking, sewing, and maybe there's a little uh, time for reading or arranging flowers, watering the garden. Um, that pre-industrial set of activities was changing. After the Civil War, there were more dense urban residential neighborhoods being built up within cities. Some of them had commercial laundries. Of, this is one in Boston in the 1880s. And some had hotel restaurants. There was a logic of public and semi-public infrastructure, which was being promoted by designers such as Frederick Law Olmsted, the parks designer who favored municipal kitchens, laundries, and nurseries, and municipal steam heat, as well as public parks. And favored by people like Jane Addams, who built a playground, a childcare center, and a public kitchen in her settlement house in Chicago as well as apartments for the settlement workers and a dining room for the residents who were mostly first generation career women. So overall, it's a time of tremendous technological change and a time when densities are changing in the built environment. Carriages are giving way to horse cars and electric streetcars. Bicycles are followed by automobiles and trucks. Row houses give way to apartment hotels. Here is a small apartment hotel in Boston in the 1880s, uh, which also has a dining room for the residents and um, other kinds of service. And it's a time of great change. The material feminists meet this urbanizing America with a series of proposals over the period from the late 1860s to the early 1930s. And I'm going to tell you about many of the particular personalities involved. I also want to say first, they move from some ideas about housewives cooperatives to other ideas about professions for women which involve uh, more expertise being expended on these questions of reproduction. And then finally, they move to the question of what would be adequate support for women who are in diverse careers and professions. This is the woman who gets everybody excited in the late 1860s, Melusina Faye Peirce. She starts something called the Cambridge Cooperative Housekeeping Society in a building on Bow Street near Harvard University She's organized a number of other women in her neighborhood to form a producer's cooperative. She believes that in this producer's cooperative, housewives and former servants will work together to produce clean laundry, cooked food, and mended clothing, and that they will deliver the clean laundry back to the husbands for cash on delivery. <laughs> It creates a sensation. 
She's one of nine children. Her father's a Vermont clergyman, and her mother is an exhausted woman who hasn't had enough time to pursue her musical talents. She's criticized pre-industrial housework where women have to take up many trades at once. This is something actually her great aunt, Caroline Howard Gilman, had railed about in print before. Melusina Faye Peirce got onto it. Among the Harvard families she gathers and the various intellectuals uh, are members of the group with some ties to earlier communitarian settlements, such as Brook Farm and the Oneida community. She herself is a student of Louis Agassiz in Cambridge. She's the wife of Charles Sanders Peirce. She launches the campaign with articles in the Atlantic Monthly in 1868. And she says things like, it is just as necessary and just as honorable for a wife to earn money as it is for her husband. She introduces plans, uh, and these are diagrams based on her plans to show what she believes is the ideal neighborhood. Four kitchenless houses gathered together in a block and nine blocks of kitchenless houses for a total of 36 households sharing a neighborhood work center. Here are the kitchenless houses, and then here's four to a block, those houses, and then that's a neighborhood work center. And here's another neighborhood on the same plan. Her experiment is partially successful. It goes on for a couple of years, but the families uh, are in many ways divided about whether this is a good thing. She has developed a group called the Council of Gentlemen, and this is in the um, set of rules they're following. Her experiment is followed very carefully in the various uh, papers by women's suffrage activists at the time. Uh, Stanton and Anthony are a little worried about that council of gentlemen. They call it licking of the ma male boot. Uh, and indeed, the council of gentlemen does eventually come round to saying that it's time to stop the experiment. One man has said, what, my wife cooperate to make other men comfortable? No, indeed. Melusina Peirce travels widely, visiting producers' co-ops all over New England and there are hundreds of them at that time, and then she's in England, connecting with the Rochdale cooperators and talking to a number of British architects. She writes a book in 1880, which is her final manifesto, she says. Oh, and by that time, I think she's uh, split from Purse. They are divorced. She takes a deep breath and says two things women must do somehow as the conditions not only of their future happiness, progress, and the elevation of their sex, but of its bare respectability and morality. First, they must earn their own living. Second, they must be organized among themselves. The Woman's Journal, the Suffrage Journal, reviews her book. Their comment is, try again, Mrs. Peirce. When we have placed in your hands the ballot, they believe that's the lever that's going to enable this kind of organization of women's labor to proceed. She's a complex figure, a very complex figure. She's fascinating, fascinating. She's very much in favor of women taking over women's sphere, but she's not sure that male suffrage is what women should want. Instead, she wants women to elect women to a U.S. Senate body that's equal to the House of Representatives. In other words, she wants to take over half the show uh, rather than have women integrated into men's voting activities. Uh, she's fascinating because every time you read her, you can't decide whether she's a conservative or an extreme radical. She's both at the same time. And of course, she infuriates people sometimes uh, because she's very clear in putting these divergent views out there. Well, after Melusina Peirce comes Marie Stevens Howland. Oh, sorry. Let me, let me back up a minute. A much, there's a lot of publicity about purse, and some of that publicity comes in the form of cartoons about men's and women's roles in the household. Uh, this is Courier and Ives, the age of ma iron man as he expects to be. Purse did not believe that men would be doing the housework and that women would be out voting. But here, Courier and Ives, very worried about this idea, the men are inside. The, the coachman has his hands in the laundry tub, and the um, 
husband is doing some sewing and rocking the cradle while the woman steps out in the coach with her former housemaids as the uh, drivers. And here's another one. Uh, this one's about the same time. How it would be if some ladies <coughs> had their own way. The women are in the street in front of the saloon uh, smoking and standing around and the men are inside the saloon taking care of the babies and doing a little knitting. So <coughs> there's no doubt that people are very, very concerned about what this challenge to the world of unpaid labor in the household might mean. And there's very little agreement about what it might mean. Now, Marie Stevens Howland is the same age as Purse, but she's had a very different uh, path to <coughs> taking up these issues. She was a Lowell mill worker for several years and then became an editor and a writer and a school principal in New York City. Uh, she becomes interested in free love and anarchism and is associated with a number of radicals in New York City, uh, including uh, Woodhull and Claflin and including the activists in the IAW Section 12 who are out doing demonstrations, labor demonstrations all the time. She knows all kinds of people, uh, some of them strict Marxists. She offends them tremendously. She has ties to the Knights of Labor and the Grange. She debates socialist men who think that the ideal for socialism is a cottage with a garden and the wife at home doing the housework. Um, she then, through her contacts with these radical circles, visits France. She goes to Godin's Formilistère and sees collective childcare at the Iron Foundry, which is considered one of the main communitarian socialist uh, workers, uh, productive places in Europe. And she sees this collective childcare and she adds childcare to the program of activities that Melusina Peirce thought should be conducted in the neighborhood. She also uh, may see this at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893 at the Women's Building where there's a model childcare center along with other kinds of models of various material feminist ideas. Howland proposes a city with kitchenless houses and childcare centers in 1888 and she believes these should be run by consumers co-ops rather than producers co-ops which will go on to become a significant debate and she says, have the most perfect isolated family possible. It cannot supply the conditions for integral growth to the young, nor can it afford sufficient leisure and freedom from care to the adults. Next comes Mary Livermore. Now, Mary Livermore is far, far more well known as an activist for women's issues than either Peirce or Howland. And she's a bit older. Uh, she's of an older generation. She's active in the American Women's Suffrage Association with Lucy Stone, Julia Ward Howe. Uh, she's both a suffrage and temperance leader, and she's been a leader in the U.S. Sanitary Commission efforts to provision the Union Army in the Civil War. She's the editor of the Women's Journal from 1870 on. She reports on every cooperative housekeeping experiment all across the United States and even some in England. And about the women running them, she says, they must be women of pluck, of consecrated common sense, who know how to compel success. Now she adds uh, something to this mix. She advocates male involvement in housework. The husbands and the sons, she thinks, must get on board for this. She knows of kitchenless cottages in places like the Methodist Camp Meeting Ground at Oak Bluffs. And she has some ties to the nationalist movement. Uh, in the 18, 1887, Edward Bellamy writes his famous book, Looking Backward, 2018 The hero of Looking Backward wakes up in socialist Boston in 2000, and everyone is dining in large public dining halls um, and living in apartments without kitchens where they have a very comfortable and easy life. Livermore also adds something to this um, set of ideas. She's an advocate of family dining clubs. And there are some women in the suffrage movement 
who move their dining tables out of the house, and they take over one house in a given town, uh, move their dining room tables in, and eat their meals there because they have taken over the dining rooms at home for the suffrage movement's correspondence. Here we have Warren, Ohio, 1903 to 1923, dining club, American Women's Suffrage Headquarters in that town. There's still a certain amount of male resistance. Uh, one man who's fairly positive says, she's always cooking or has just cooked or is just going to cook or is too tired from cooking. If there is a way out of this with anything to eat still in sight, for heaven's sake, tell us. <laughs> and then here's another husband who's not so happy. Would you like to think everyone else in the square was eating the same dinner as you? <laughs> well, it's time to get serious about food, and so we come to Ellen Swallow Richards. Ellen Swallow Richards was occasionally hired out as a servant, as a young woman in Massachusetts. But she persevered, she got an education, she was the first woman to receive a Bachelor of Science at MIT in 1873. She's the first woman appointed to the MIT faculty in 1875. And she coins the term ecology, which she spells O-E-K-O-L-O-G-Y, as the economics of consumption. She wants to start a new scientific field that deals with everything involved with consumption and social reproduction. She's interested in philanthropic efforts to feed people. Here's a philanthropic soup kitchen in New York in 1874, after the panic the previous year, people were starving. And ultimately, she, she starts the New England Kitchen, which is a kitchen, community kitchen, which is going to be like a scientific laboratory. She's interested in nutrition. She wants there to be healthy food available at a reasonable cost in every neighborhood in America. And these kitchens do get built in New York, in Boston, at the Chicago World's Fair and ultimately she does one for Hull House. Here's the one at the Chicago World's Fair. It's made to look like a little cottage that can fit right into any neighborhood. And here's Hull House, which I'm sure you've all seen before. Now the remarkable thing about the proposals for the New England kitchen, she expects well-paid women scientists to run them. And if you look at this, it's not so very different from fast food in America, it just lacks the well, I mean, she has the well-paid women scientists, but we don't eventually come to see that particular development. And what happens to Ellen Swallow Richards' field of ecology? Ultimately, it's renamed home economics, and it loses a lot of its original political fervor and scientific rigor. Although I do have to say when my book came out, the Home Economics Association wanted me to come and tell them about the early days. Um, that was quite a trip. So, from Hull House and the public kitchen and restaurant in Hull House, which is meant to be the alternative to a saloon, as well as the public kitchen that serves the dining room for the settlement workers, there are a lot of things going there that are a very sophisticated support system for career women. And so we get to Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Gilman, uh, again, if Mary Livermore is well known in her own time, Gilman is the most famous of all these women. She starts out um, thinking about becoming a public lecturer, and she's mentored by a woman named Helen Campbell, who's worked in settlements and is a specialist on housing for working women. She has some ties to the nationalist movement. Ultimately, Gilman becomes a very, very well-known lecturer, and she writes Women in Economics in 1898, which is a best-selling book. She rails at old traditional ideas of the fa single family home. She says things like, home sweet home has never meant housework sweet housework. <laughs> and she says things like, how has the um, current time preserved alive the prehistoric squaw, meaning that 
you know, in rural areas and some places, housekeeping is just too primitive to be believed. So she wants there to be something sophisticated that is a support for not just working women with careers, but maybe even single parent mothers with children. She is a single parent mother herself. So she popularizes the idea of an apartment hotel for working women with children. And she writes novels, including one called What Diantha Did, which is about a woman who is an entrepreneur who introduces community kitchens in a California town called Orchardina. It's not as famous as some of her other novels, but it was very well received in its time, which was about 1910. In her novels, we get a reflection of the commercial dinner delivery services, which were, by that time, quite common in many places around the country. Here's one in Pittsburgh. Uh, I also have images uh, of one that was in New Haven, not far from where I teach. The commercial dinner delivery service uh, was bringing you food, and it came in this gadget called a heat retainer. The heat retainer, for a while, had more investors than the refrigerator, than the domestic refrigerator. Uh, it's one of those technologies you, I have never actually seen a heat retainer. Maybe there's one somewhere in the world. Uh, we never think of there having been a rival to the refrigerator, but this, this was it. Gilman is connected to the Garden Cities movement in England, where there are cooperative quadrangles being built for working women, which have um, organized uh, meal services. And she's also connected to some women architects, including Mary Coleman Stucker, who displays this uh, kind of a model at the Women's Building in 1893. They're going to be row houses grouped around a central kitchen and kindergarten. And the food is going to be delivered to private houses through an underground electric tram. And there will be professional women running that central building, the kitchen and the kindergarten, and there are apartments for the workers uh, and a meeting hall and library and kindergarten in that building. So it's definitely separating the people who own the houses from the people who are providing these um, services. Gilman thinks it can be a good business. People can be well paid. This is quite controversial. And I think at this point, there is a real uh, parting of the ways between people who want the housewives to do it and people who think that there's going to be a class divide here. Here is Alice Constance Austin showing in California about 1916 a number of people in a community outside Los Angeles, how the kitchenless house with the underground tram bringing the food is going to work. She's also a Garden City type and ultimately produces a book about her ideas. But here are some servants a photograph from 1905, and you do have to ask yourself, when Gilman said that this all had to be on a professional basis, uh, and the, organ the former servants would be working in the apartment hotel, or feminist apartment hotel, or, you know, what that really meant. Especially because um, Tara Hunter has documented from the 1880s the African-American washerwomen's strikes in southern cities. And ha this was not something that was integrated into a lot of the material feminist thinking, but clearly it was going on at the same time and to similar ends. Now, Gilman has a disciple named Henrietta Rodman who tries to take Gilman's ideas to Greenwich Village and there's a proposal for a big feminist apartment hotel to be built in Greenwich Village. I followed this controversy. The New York papers were all over it. It was absolutely fascinating to me to find. Uh, when they got into some trouble about their funding, there was a big article in the New, in the New York Times about the feminist Paradise Palace it was criticized as being a project of women, including socialist women who wanted to rise high above the labors of the house. And it was written by Melusina Faye Peirce's younger sister. So they were still arguing when my last of these six women got her proposals together. 
And Ethel Puffer Howes is 12 years younger than Charlotte Perkins Gilman. She's born in 1872. She gets her BA at Smith. She's considered a very, very brilliant student in both mathematics and aesthetics. She travels uh, to Germany for a year for more graduate education, and when she comes back, uh, she is accepted at Harvard as a graduate student, and she earns a PhD, but Harvard isn't ready to give a woman a PhD, so Radcliffe gives her this PhD in philosophy and psychology. She teaches at Harvard from 1899 to 1908, but her name is not in the catalog because she's a woman. She marries, she has two children, she's a professor at Wellesley. Suffrage is one, but she said it's just a means to an end. She said the woman question has never had an answer. And she, like Melusina Peirce, writes a series of articles for the Atlantic Monthly. She persuades Smith College to launch a very significant experiment called the Institute for the Coordination of Women's Interests. And from 1926 to 1931, at Smith College, under Ethel Puffer Howe's direction, she runs a course for college freshmen talking about all of the complexities for educated women and careers and private and public life. She brings in Edith Elmer Wood, who is a noted housing expert, and Alice Norton, who is a pioneer uh, specialist in scientific food preparation. And they get it all together. They run a dinner delivery kitchen that serves a couple of thousand dinners to people. They have proposals for housing. They run the course for Smith students. And it would seem as though they are actually getting the act together in a way uh, that involves a significant amount of diverse expertise. So what happens to the Institute for the Coordination of Women's Interests? Well, in 1929, Christine Frederick publishes her book, Selling Mrs. Consumer. It's dedicated to Herbert Hoover, who is uh, first Secretary of Commerce and then President. And Christine Frederick says there's a direct and vital interest in the subject of young love and marriage. The founding and furnishing of new houses is a major industrial circumstance in the US. Hoover is building the coalition of people who come to the President's Conference on Housing and Home Ownership and believe that the way to recover from the Depression is to build a million single family houses a year. And he has developed a very large lobby through the 20s and early 30s of people who produce building materials, people who sell appliances, and a number, uh, a number of other folks who are in the real estate and banking business and are setting up the, they are writing the legislation which will be FHA, they are setting up uh, building and zoning regulations which will be adopted across the country. And they're getting ready to really take advantage of this major industrial circumstance of young love and marriage. So Howes attends, attends that conference in 1931, but she's given a very minor role. And then the next thing is that uh, some of the faculty push this very brilliant philosopher out of Smith College for what they call her unintellectual and unacademic concerns. So, It's a moment uh, when this country is mobilizing for that post-World War II world where Christine Frederick's Mrs. Consumer uh, will be married to Mr. Homeowner. Formerly, he might have been G.I. Joe and she might have been Rosie the Riveter, but they're moving to very, very different public roles. And United States is gearing up uh, in the late 20s and early 30s for that other circumstance. So um, let me tell you a little bit about what I went on to do after documenting the women uh, who were the material feminists in the grand domestic revolution. In some ways, as a young scholar, I wasn't 
entirely satisfied with what I understood or what I did not understand. There were many things that still seemed sort of mysterious to me about public policy and real estate. Um, but I did know at the end of writing that book uh, that it was very, very difficult to understand socializing the unpaid labor of the household, um, the world of woman's sphere at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. So I asked myself how the idea of woman's place, as well as place based on class and race, was embedded in the design of housing and infrastructure in the 20th century. And just to tell you briefly what I did in redesigning the American dream, I compared three approaches. I went back and I looked again at what people said in the Soviet Union about what they were going to do as they were trying to suggest that a woman would receive, uh, that a woman would achieve full citizenship only as a paid worker. They offered a few examples of some multifamily housing which would have facilities like kindergartens and dining halls. And this is a sketch from 1929. This is, this is a sketch for one of those communal dining halls. And you will notice there is a conveyor belt coming down the middle here with a big arrow. That means the food is moving toward you in this socialist paradise. Uh, they didn't build too many of these projects. They didn't really have the will for it. But what did happen in the Soviet Union is um, after 1929 or 1930, they backed away from putting any, any uh, real resources into housing at all. Uh, consumption was to be minimized. Women were all going to be paid workers. They might have their children in state childcare, but there would really be no support for whatever labor had to go on in the private family housing unit. And that was often crowded and minimally designed and minimally equipped. There was no liberation coming there. Now, in the USA, this is all much more familiar. We had what I call the haven strategy. The woman is to be Mrs. Consumer. Uh, and here is Levittown in the late 1940s. It's an urban scale development. It will ultimately be 70 or 80,000 people. But it's mul uh, it is going to be those little tiny houses, two bedroom houses. They don't even have any ur real urban infrastructure here like sewers. Um, and people like Joseph McCarthy have been busy working with Levitt and other people to criticize any kind of multifamily housing as un-American. They say it is a communist plot to simply live in an apartment house. Uh, they say that the, Levitt says that the man who lives in a Levittown house uh, can in no way be a communist because he has too much to do. And they have endless advertisements about women in kitchens. She, it's love at first sight all over America. She sees the American kitchen, so they buy the house. And here's this, this one I like even better. I feel like Alice in Wonderland in my <laughs> built well living condition kitchen. And here finally is the critique. Nina Lean photograph, and a composed photograph for Life magazine in the 40s. Seven days worth of work for a uh, suburban housewife. So I call this the haven strategy, and I would also call it an architecture of gender. And eventually, the women in these uh, single family houses have to enter paid work. They're paying for the houses and the appliances and everything else, but they're still responsible for most nurturing. <laughs> if ever you have a chance to catch the kitchen debate of 1959 on YouTube, between Khrushchev and Nixon, you will have a great example of communist and capitalist officials arguing about the industrial strategy of the housing versus the haven strategy. Khrushchev doesn't think they should spend too much money on housing. Nixon says, oh, it's fantastic. You know, we have so many choices of consumer goods. In the end, they agree that they like pretty girls. <laughs> but they both do think surely for their nation's economies, they are set on different roads and those roads are very significant. Now, there is still a middle road, but it's not that well understood. I would call that the neighborhood strategy, 
I would say it's represented by what Ethel Puffer Howes was trying to do, and there continue to be projects in U.S. and Europe that emphasize neighborhood supports for women as valued workers. And they also insist on a woman's right to enter all kinds of jobs, not simply to take on those jobs of housewife, social worker, or child care worker. So here we have, in the 1930s, a collective house in Stockholm, organized by Alva Myrdal and designed by Sven Markelius, a very noted architect who believed in it so much that he actually moved in and served as the building's handyman to make sure nothing would go wrong. It had childcare, it had a community dining room, it had apartments for people living there, and it also had the possibility of live workspaces for people who wanted to work next to their own apartment. And it lasted for a very long time, and there are a number of other it, similar experiments in Sweden, in Denmark, and other European countries. Now, the U.S. did not entirely abandon the earlier tradition because during World War II, in Vanport City, Oregon, Kaiser understood that he needed women as valued workers. He built six huge child care centers that were open 24 hours a day. They had infirmaries for sick children, bathtubs so that the children could be bathed before the women workers picked them up, and cooked dinners that were picked up when the women came to get their children. They even had special windows, lines of vision out to the shipyard so that the children could see when their mothers, the ships their mothers were working on were launched. They did really know that design could make something happen. And throughout the 70s, there were co-housing projects in places like Denmark and the United States. Uh, and in 1994 came the European Charter for Women in the City said daily life as seen through a woman's eyes must become a political issue. It said, rediscover the city through women's eyes, abolish stereotypes. Those women involved with the European Charter have various kinds of experiments all over Europe. And they do understand that the, still, the issue still on the table is the unpaid labor in reproduction, the nurturing work, what sociologist Arlie Hochschild in 1989 called the second shift, the 40 hours per week of nurturing of a home and children that someone, either female or male, must take on after 40 hours in the factory or office. And day after day, week after week, month after month, it mounts up. This kind of caring work is what economist Nancy Fulbright calls the invisible heart in her 2001 book on economics and family values. Reciprocity, love, obligation, happiness, money, time, these are all the ribbons flying around the jacket for this book. And Fulbright opposes take your daughter to work day to teach your son to babysit day. She says the first is liberal feminism and the second is social feminism. And much as I enjoy the work of this wonderful economist who's won any number of prizes, I think she has left out that old material feminist tradition. She argues for a feminist theory of family values and caring, but I would insist it must be grounded in a better approach to the material conditions, the housing and the neighborhood design, uh, in order to have a chance of accomplishing something. So let me conclude where I began. MoMA used design to draw a wide audience into that counter space show because they knew that a kitchen, any kitchen, which uh, brings you to confront everyday architecture and material culture, is something that millions of people can relate to and understand. But they did present that kitchen as an artifact far too narrowly and without its historical or political context. The architect of the Frankfurt Kitchen thought she had risen above politics and improved 
women's lot by designing a more efficient workplace for women. The material feminists were more lively and more imaginative. They argued women's unpaid labor should be challenged politically by all sorts of designs for new kinds of spaces, technologies, and infrastructures. And beginning in 1848, they wrote futurist fiction about feminist cities I have not even had time to discuss, but many of those feminist utopias are in my book, beginning with a woman called Jane Sophia Appleton in Bangor, Maine. So those material feminists, well, like the suffrage campaigners, they wanted to connect women to public life um, but to do it in a different way. And like the progressive era settlement workers who pioneered municipal housekeeping but tolerated segregated settlement houses, the material feminists were often unclear about how class and race would affect their hopes and plans. Interestingly, they were all red baited through the 1920s when right-wing men claim that women in the temperance, suffrage, and home economics movements, along with the AAUW and the League of Women Voters and the Women's Joint Congressional Committee, all the Democrats, all the Republicans, the right-wing men claim they were taking their orders from Bolshevik feminist Alexandra Kollontai. They were all attacked as anti-family and anti-American. Just as many feminists are being baited right now. And in some ways, the real closing of that materialist feminist tradition came around the time that the Women's Journal became the magazine Women's Citizen for the League of Women Voters. And Carrie Chapman Catt, who had worked hard as a suffragist and editor, caved in in 1923. She ran a contest. And it was to be judged by Christine Frederick. The contest topic was, well, so what should we do about, about everything to do with domestic labor? And the winner was an essay by a woman. Uh, it was titled, The Eight-Hour Day at Home. So what does this actually mean for possibilities about <laughs> women's history, museums of women's history? I just have one little set of suggestions. The National Women's History Museum is doing some very, very exciting things with existing online exhibits. And there's a lot more to do. I mean, one is recovering little known aspects of women's history. Domestic revolution was part of the world that the first wave of the women's movement debated, along with trade unions for women workers and suffrage. But we've read much more about the latter. Secondly, I think it's important to juxtapose alternative interpretations of women's history to widen the analysis of gender across the divides of class, race, and national experience. My debate with the museum about the kitchen exhibit would be one example. Controversy should be good. Controversy should bring me to their exhibit, and it should bring them to reconsidering the domestic revolution. And third, I would say, I think it's quite important to explore where social history meets spatial history around gender, race, and class. There are shifting boundaries of public and private space affecting bodies, rooms, buildings, housing, neighborhoods, and cities over time highlighted in this controversy over the kitchen and the neighborhood. These issues were political issues over a century ago, and we haven't in any way finished with them. Anthropologist and urban planner Janet Abulagad wrote in 1974, the city we seek as women is a human city in which all will share the pleasures and pains, where women will, neither, where women will be neither dolls nor drudges, and where the role specializations so idealized in the past, females nurturing and males laboring, will give way to whole and cooperating humans. And that's where I think we should go. Thank you. You want to stay there for questions?
Yes. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. I'm sure that Professor Hayden will be happy to answer your questions. Yeah. Well, please identify yourself. Uh, actually, do we have? Uh, oh yeah. Wait for a microphone. Hi, Michelle Lamprecos. Um, I was wondering if you could say the fascinating. Can it speak into the mic. The yes. fascinating talk. Look forward to talking to you more about it during the break. But I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about servants, because I would think that a number of the women, the material feminists you described, like Paris, um, might have come from well-to-do families where they actually didn't have to do a lot of the drudgery themselves and yet they were organizing these efforts to make it so that women would not have to. So well, did they I not have servants? Themselves? It's mixed. Um, Howland was a Lowell mill worker, came from a poor rural family. Richards was a servant herself, uh, although she managed to get an education. Purse came from a family with nine children and claimed that her mother's health broke from overwork. Um, Uh, Howe certainly came from a more comfortable uh, background. Livermore. Uh, in that, you know, she managed also to get the most education. Um, so I think, it, I think it was mixed. And I think um, at the beginning of Grand Domestic Revolution, I did have a number of statistics about the numbers of women in domestic service and also the numbers of women working as laundresses. And that was changing over this period as women just found factory work more acceptable in some cases than working as servants. Um, it was also changing as some women did get jobs as professional kindergarten workers or something like that. So there's no doubt that there is a class divide here, but I don't think it's an absolute class divide. The trick is to figure out the way that these issues bore down on people all together. And clearly, uh, Charlotte, oh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman was the one who was most interested in putting the servants into a feminist apartment hotel. She had grown up living um, with her mother uh, in a number of kind of disorganized communal households of various sorts, and she felt particularly keen, you know, not, not to have the kind of domestic disorder that she'd un experienced as a young woman. And Another thing I guess I would say is that many of these, uh, doing the research for the book, many of the connections um, were across family networks. You know, sometimes there were grandmothers and granddaughters, sometimes there were um, great aunts or cousins. Uh, you know, multiple generations of women wrestled with this and sometimes um, across family connections and not always, not always, uh, not easily. But sometimes they did give each other a lot of support. Other times it was considered not respectable to deal with these issues. And I also had trouble in the research when women were not signing their articles or identified by name, you know, it would be Mrs. B or Miss X or something, which is not what the <coughs> researcher always wants to find. Uh, eventually, though, I, there were some real surprises. I met Melusina Purse's um, Great granddaughter, or something like that, who uh, you know, who turned up one day. More questions? Yes, back there. Can you what was please use the mic? Question. What was your third and suggestion? Could you identify yourself, please. Kate Clinton, would you explore where social history meets what? Spatial history. Thank you. That these things all play themselves out in the built environment, in one way or another. We are now a nation, a suburban nation, a nation of tracked houses. And the number of housing starts per year is a major economic indicator of whether the, you know, whether the economy is doing all right or not. Um, and all this foreclosure trouble over the last few years has been a, a, a huge um, tidal wave of difficulty. Not something recent, but really, oh, something that is built way back into many of the things done in the 20s and the 30s to prepare the way for the subdivisions of the 50s. 
And um, so I think we, we have to really scrutinize our own spatial arrangements in order to understand how far we've come from the time when some of those 19th century women criticized uh, private houses as being isolated and, and uh, requiring too much labor. I mean, we now have the majority of American families in those isolated houses in a way that, you know, in the 19th century, many, many poorer families were concentrated in tenements. Heidi, um, can you just wait for the mic? Heidi Hartman, Institute for Women's Policy Research. Um, Dolores, as you know, I've loved your work forever since we both started working in this area. And um, my dissertation was on housework from 1900 to 1930, and I argued there that very much the individual home in the suburb was supported through the expansion of consumer credit, which there's an article about in this issue of the w Wilson Quarterly, uh, including consumer credit uh, for products and uh, that collective washing, uh, laundry, you know, was internalized into the home with right. the advance of, of the home machine. So it does seem like, um, you know, I individual, what I think I called individualistic capitalist patriarchy won out. <laughs> and uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who had the most fabulous vocabulary, she talked about the sex UO economic framework. She talked about the home being a breeding uh, ground of germs and disease and garbage, <laughs> and that the only way to sanitize the house was to remove the kitchen from the house because <laughs> the kitchen generated all the germs and garbage. <laughs> and I mean, it was absolutely, I mean, you're reading this stuff and it's been written in 1898 and 1900 and you just absolutely can't believe it. It was so fabulous. <laughs> and it's, it's great that you shared that with us. Well, thank you, Heidi. I've enjoyed all of your work too. and. One of the things that was fascinating was to see that many of those little individual uh, home appliances came apart after came came forward after World War One because uh, there were a number of war industries that decided you know it was time to convert to these consumer goods, and it's also very tied into issues about cheap energy. The thought that you know the more devices you have using more energy, that the better it is. And GE sold municipal generating equipment as well as those appliances. So the, they had a wonderful contest. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Bliss were the subjects of that contest and General Electric asked, you know, who can design the best house for Mr. and Mrs. Bliss? It was the one that had every single appliance that GE made <laughs> to plug in. <laughs> it's sort of like Mr. Wise and Mr. Newhouse, you know, there's a whole genre of these little stories about inadvertisements in women's magazines. You know the uh, ideal couples and the, how, they, how they promote this, this world of the single family house with all the appliances within it. Um, if I can just interject a question. I'm building on both of both Heidi's and Michelle's questions. Two things occur to me. One is that um, I'm, I'm wondering if you came across evidence or if you think it was, um, if you think you could argue that the resistance to the communal kitchens and laundries came from the fear that this was sort of the slippery slope toward c communal property altogether. I mean, it's interesting that a lot of those plans for the, the city blocks and so forth still had private houses in them, but there were, would be the communal kitchen. I mean, do you think, do, do you ever come across evidence of, you know, I mean, now we see that people were moving toward individual private homes, but, you know, was that sort of, do you think that was in people's minds at that time? Well, From, uh, say, 1870 to about 1910, there were people moving to streetcar suburbs uh, out of tenements in center cities sometimes, uh, which was a step up. But those were often still two and three family houses in the east, on the east coast anyway. Um, and there were people moving into apartment houses, although at one point the apartment house was called the most dangerous enemy American domesticity has ever had to face. That was, that was uh, because it was thought that women in apartment houses would no longer have to do so much housework and therefore they might not uh, be respectable women anymore. <laughs> this is the editor of Architectural Record giving his sermon to the world. Uh, so the apart, yes, people did move into collective dwellings, uh, 
middle class collective dwellings in this period. But then in the 1920s, there was more suburbanization. Um, and by the 1940s, 50s, 60s, then much, much more suburbanization. Um, all, in my book, Building Suburbia, which is a history of American suburbs from 1820 to the present, um, I do take this land, suburban landscape apart and argue there's seven layers in the suburban landscape. So by the 50s, I would call it the sitcom suburb. <laughs> and after that come the edge cities and then the rural fringes. But what's significant about that period from the uh, late 40s on is the amount of government subsidy that goes into suburbanization. There are mortgage subsidies. There are all kinds of arrangements for banks to give producers, uh, to, to give production advances to speculative developers. So there's an enormous federal uh, push that goes in the direction of those suburban residences. And that really is what would distinguish the 40s from the 20s. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. It's okay. There you go. Oh, okay. It's just a comment that, and you might include the fact that the highways were being spread out into the uh, into the suburban areas um, because this was supposed to be helping the economy by building the highways out there. I mean, Levittown would not exist without the Long Island Railroad that went out to it because you couldn't get there too many other ways. Well, and that's. The uh, sitcom suburbs do precede the highways uh, in terms of laying the groundwork for those sitcom suburbs in the legislation in the 20s and 30s. And they are built in the late 40s. The highway bill, the interstate highway bill is 1956. Um, and before that, in 1953, there's something really interesting, which is um, tax changes for commercial greenfield property. So people get very wealthy speculating on commercial greenfield properties, shopping malls, um, fast food places, motels. They get these huge tax deductions that then the highways will enable people to really take. So the highways are not, are not the prime generator of this, although there are people pushing for highways earlier. Um, the biggest highway building takes place a little later. It's, it's a complicated story. Yeah, it's, it's not a story that's told very well in a lot of places. I was um, laughing because I was visiting the uh, American History Museum across the street, and there is an exhibit on transportation. And interestingly enough, it was funded by General Motors, the AAA, and the asphalt pavement lobby. <laughs> uh, so y y you don't necessarily get the straight story there. But this actually raises, I just let me just interject one question because it goes along with this. In some of your other books, I can't remember which one, you talk about sort of the layout of cities and how that either contributes to or doesn't contribute to facilitating women's lives and the work family balance and all that kind of thing. Could you say a little bit about that? I mean, I think you, I think that's you who've written about that. Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, taking the kids to child care, take, going shopping, you know, d dealing with all that. Right, right. Well, when uh, this country became a suburban country, um, it was pretty clear that there would be multiple destinations that people had to manage. There would be the home, the workplace where the paid work was done, then there would be perhaps the child care center or the school. And so um, the kind of suburbanization that was done in the United States was done without much uh, land use planning. We really don't have a national land use planning policy, just as we don't have a national child care policy. So a tremendous amount of time is spent connecting these separated destinations. And there's a new term that I discovered somewhere, which is taxi parent. I don't know if any of you have heard this. But related to helicopter the taxi, parent. The taxi parent. <laughs> the taxi parent is just busy, you know, driving everybody around from place to place to place. And there are even catalogs that sell you the equipment for your station wagon or your SUV, the food locker, the sports equipment locker, the, you know, the place you put the ballet shoes, whatever, so you can be a more effective taxi parent. Uh, it's, not a good, it's not a good situation. Right. Yeah, back there. <laughs> 
Thank you. Can you <clears throat> take, wait for the mic? Oh, you have it. Okay. Yes, thank you. My name is Jan Duplain. And I want to thank you for a exhilarating talk. I frankly, I am not knowledgeable at all, and the, with the whole area that you are that you are, spoke to us about today, and it was something that I'm. So I, it was a it was a real learning curve for me. Um, I I wish you would talk a little bit about. I know you mentioned Louise Bethune as being the first member of the AIA, AIA as I recall, and. Um, also, I wanted to get your feel on if you were to choose a woman that had particular impact of all those that you mentioned, and it may not be a, a fair question, but uh, and the one being the most famous being Charlotte Gilman. But if you were going to take one woman and then put today in terms of a woman that has had the the, the most impact, if you will, on the grand domestic revolution today, uh, uh, who, who might you s suggest we would read or be knowledgeable about, other than yourself? <laughs> well, um, Louise Bethune uh, opened her office in 1881. Yes, she was the first female member of the American Institute of Architects. So she's one of those pioneers. Some of you want to read about the early days of women in architecture. Uh, there's a book called Women in American Architecture, which is the catalog of a big exhibit edited by, su organized by Susanna Torrey. Um, and many of these pioneer women are profiled in there. And there are a number of other books, too, because that exhibit uh, was some decades ago. Uh, in terms of the domestic revolution now, well, I think that what happened uh, is not that, that there was a straight tradition of people continuing to experiment. Indeed, it surprised me to realize that Betty Friedan was a student at Smith College, and yet she called all this the problems that have no name. And so she is uh, graduating, I think, in 1942. She's there from 38 to 42. So there's actually a seven-year gap between when Howes leaves and when Friedan arrives. And whether this is um, genuinely ignorance or whether it's just simply a desire to take the polemic and begin in a different place, I don't know. But the problems that have no name is where there's a total disconnection. And when I began my research, lots of people in women's history told me I wasn't going to find anything. Uh, they were convinced that it couldn't be done. I said, well, if they built things and they made things, you know, there'll be some material culture, there'll be some architecture. I thought I would at least get an article out of it, and I was very, very surprised to see how extensive and broad uh, the agitation had been. But I do, you know, then I do think there is a disconnection. Yes, back there. Um, with everything that you've studied and researched, have you found a plan for a city or a neighborhood block that you think is the most feasible or sustainable, or have you perhaps developed one of your own? You know, I don't think there's any, sing I don't think there's any single plan that uh, you can advocate. I think the most important thing is that we should all understand that in that time at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, many activists around women's issues had hopes for a larger economic transformation and a larger physical transformation than ever occurred. And when I think about how to explain this, um, I would say that when Lawrence Goodwin wrote about the populists, he said one of the difficult things about writing the history of the populist movement is that Americans find it hard to believe that there were democratic expectations and hopes that were larger in a previous time than people might have today. And I raise this as really one set of feminist hopes and expectations that were larger than ones we would naturally assume uh, we can have today. And I don't think we should be rushing out to build kitchenless houses around community work centers. Uh, those were the proposals in a time when they saw technology and architecture changing around them uh, at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th. Um, we would really have to think very hard about what would be appropriate in our own time. And I do think there are, in the end, labor issues, uh, which is an unpaid labor issues, nurturing issues, caring issues, um, 
that need to be much more uh, strongly understood and debated. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, propose a physical solution. However, I could say that the European socialist women and their male allies uh, wouldn't necessarily feel that way. And there are lots of experiments in different parts of Europe house, where it's much easier to do multifamily housing, where there's a much stronger uh, base of support for social services. Um, and you know, I just got an invitation to a European conference that's going to be held in a few weeks, and it looks very fascinating. I'm not going to go, um, but I'm not able to go. But you know, I think there are things bubbling there that are different from what's happened in the U.S. They don't necessarily have this whole nation blanketed with all the single-family houses. And if we think about those single-family houses, in the context of financing them, in the context of finding the energy to get to them, and from them, um, we have a lot of very complex issues to deal with that um, would make the logistics pretty different, I think, from what people might be doing in Europe right away. Well, I, let's, I think we, we should uh, finish on that note. Thank you so much, Dolores, for bringing us this wonderful history and, <laughs> and a sense that there may be some possibilities <laughs> for some reform in the, in the present.